to today's brown bag talk from the archaeological research facility. Um, we'd like to start by making a few announcements. Today, um, this afternoon at four o'clock, we're having our data conversations workshop number one um, on data quality control. So this is gonna be a conversation about um, trustworthiness and quality of the data that we use um, in our work in archeology. span We hope you can attend, there's a link there. Um, you have to register for this because it's actually taking place on Zoom, not on, on YouTube. Um, next week, um, on November 3rd, Wednesday, at our regular time at 12.10 on YouTube, we are going to hear from Sarah Ann Knudsen, who's going to be speaking about revealing Arab and trans-Eurasian cultural heritage from museums-based materials. So we hope you can join us for that on YouTube. And then also next week, we have a, um, an event that the ARF is, is co-sponsoring, um, part of the Unsilencing the Archives lecture series hosted by the Bade Museum and the Palestine Exploration Fund and the ARF. And um, that is going to be a talk on November 4th, Thursday at 9 a.m. Pacific on the, our YouTube channel. And it's called um, Guarding Archaeology, Everyday Labor and the British Mandate Department of Antiquities by um, Sarah Irving from Staffordshire University. So we hope you can join us for that. And um, now we'll move on to our current talk for today. Thank you, Sarah. This is uh... <clears throat> a great honor to be here today and to introduce our speaker. I want to just begin, though, with our land acknowledgement. Uh, the archaeological research facility is located in Huchin, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Chochinyo speaking Ohlone people, successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of the Alameda County. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance importance to the Ohlone people, and that the ARF community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and erased living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all American Indian and Indigenous peoples. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Alec Apodaco, who is a uh, environmental archeologist and he conducts historical archeological research on indigenous stewardship practices. And is doing that uh, with the Ama Mutsun tribal band among other tribes. And he's uh, specifically interested in just looking at various stewardship strategies, cultural burning and selective harvesting and how these were done in the past, and then uh, working to see uh, with the tribe how these might be implemented today. And I think he's gonna touch a little bit on that. So it's with a uh, great uh, honor to have Alex speak. And he's gonna talk today about uh, indigenous landscape stewardship on the Santa Cruz coast, a historical ecological approach. So Alec, I'll let you take over. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you, Kent, for that kind introduction. Can someone just confirm that uh, my screen is sharing? Are you seeing the title slide? Yes. Awesome. All right. Here we we go. are good to go. Excellent. So it is my great pleasure to share what I think is fascinating collaborative work on indigenous landscape stewardship on the central coast of California. We still have big questions about how stewardship practices such as cultural burning changed and developed over long periods of time. However, it's becoming clear that the legacy of anthropogenic burning as a land management tool has many implications for some of our current problems today, such as wildfires, restoring sensitive habitats, and most importantly, returning good fire to our landscapes. A challenge has been documenting the historical stewardship practices in the archaeological record and expanding from textual based evidence like ethnographies and ethno histories. And a bigger question is, how do we return to a system where indigenous stewardship is a regular component of land management? While these issues still require much work, my goal here today is to share some of the historical, ecological and archaeological studies on Native American natural resource use on the Santa Cruz coast. Here's an outline for what I wanna to cover today. The first part is to describe the cultural landscape surveys that have been conducted over the past few years. 
I will describe the integrative approach that we have taken to documenting cultural resources on a landscape scale. This effort has identified more than a dozen previously unrecorded sites. It has also documented the condition and locations of more than 100 ethnobotanical plants and other areas with cultural and natural resources. But I'll talk more about this in just a minute. Then I'm going to talk about the preliminary eco-archaeological research of a damaged site from a wildfire in 2020. The damage to the site has exposed archaeological deposits that may provide an opportunity to learn about how native people were using natural resources in the interior of the region. This information can then be compared to what we know about sites along the coast, where the majority of our collaborative work has focused so far. I will describe some of the early trends that we are seeing and discuss potential next steps for further investigation. For the final part of my talk, I want to turn to the Native Plant Propagation Project that is being carried out by the Amamutsin Land Trust. This is an ongoing project that propagates ethnobotanical plants for ecological restoration. We will chat about how this information gathered from the integrative surveys and eco-archaeology actually articulates with this grassland restoration project. But before I launch into these case studies, I want to provide a little bit of background on who really is involved with this work. The Amamutsin are a tribe from the South Bay whose tribal members descend from the survivors of Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Batista. The Amamutsin have formed a land trust as a way to return traditional stewardship back to lands and protect cultural and natural resources. This land trust employs a native stewardship corps, which is a professional crew of tribe members that specialize in a wide range of environmental and conservation work on the Central Coast. So it is this Native Stewardship Corps that is doing really important work. And they're out there right now as I'm speaking. They're, you can find them doing burn piles, thinning Douglas fir thickets, removing exotic weeds, and even doing archaeological surveys and monitoring. I just wanted to highlight that the Amamutsin's Native Stewards are the lead singers in this work, while UC Berkeley researchers such as myself are playing backup guitar. <clears throat> now I want to talk about the landscape surveys. The Amamutsin Land Trust has developed a program called Integrative Cultural Resources Survey, which is a service they provide to land managers with proactive stewardship plans for culturally sensitive areas. The surveys are broadly designed to document, protect, and steward cultural resources at the landscape scale. And what is exactly, what exactly do we mean by integrative survey? It's just another way of saying that it's a hybrid approach to documenting cultural and natural landscape components at the same time during field work. Let's go over a couple of the main components. The first one we have are non-biological Native American cultural resources. We can think of these as archeological sites, artesian springs, mineral outcroppings, and view sheds. This may also include riverine features that are important to fisheries, such as spawning habitat for salmon. The other component of the integrative surveys are general vegetation types. Since, since large assemblages of plants such as grasslands or an oak woodland are what provide ethnobotanical plants, the tribe views vegetation types also as a culturally important resource that must be considered. We also go ahead and record ethnobotanical resources, which are plants that were traditionally used for food, crafting, ceremony, and of course, medicine. What is neat about the ethnobotanical component of these surveys is that it's leading to some interesting synergy with the Native Plant Propagation Project by creating a GIS database that contains the locations of these plants, which goes on to assist the tribe with knowing suitable locations to harvest seeds and other raw materials. Let's take a look at an example of an integrative landscape survey. We recently finished surveying one of California's newest national monuments, the Chitoni Coast Dairies in Santa Cruz County, which is about 60 miles south of Berkeley. This is beautiful land with about 5,800 acres of coastal terraces, grasslands, redwoods, and watersheds. The property is managed by the Bureau of Land Management, and they anticipate much tourism due to its scenic view sheds in proximity to a main highway. The Amamutsin sought to proactively provide the BLM with integrative surveys since most of the property in the past has not been subjected to a systematic survey. And what was done previously was performed without the participation or the inclusion of tribal perspectives. While the property totals 5,800 acres, 
our teams looked at a much smaller universe, focusing where trails and parking lots may be placed. To prioritize areas that are most likely to contain archaeological resources, we stratify the landscape so to focus on gently sloping land that occurs near a perennial water source. After we identify these areas that are predicted to have cultural resources, we then set up a systematic catch and release grid for sampling soil from the surface for artifacts. What this means is that we collect a small soil sample from the uppermost layer of mineral soil and then screen the soil for archaeological materials using a portable sieve. Surface artifact collection is nothing new to archaeologists, but it can often be a demoted technique due to its time investment and variation in surface visibility, depending on your site. But here on the coast of California, surface visibility is usually very poor. So the catch and release is something that we advocate for whenever possible. When artifacts are observed, we then sort, count, and weigh the artifacts in the field and return all the material after we're done quantifying it. For recording other cultural resources like ethnobotanical plants, we take GPS points of these locations and add them to a GIS database. This data is collected opportunistically and depends on what is visible at the time of survey. These resources can be recorded as points representing individual plants. It could also be recorded as a patch of a particularly useful plant, or it can be a large polygon representing a vegetation class such as an oak woodland or a grassland. I'll go over some of the details in a minute. For now, let's look at how the archaeological portion of the survey happens. In this example, we surveyed an area that contained a previously unrecorded site in the watershed on the property. We were able to walk our soil samples to a nearby creek, which I really think helped our visibility of artifacts. We recorded a diverse assemblage of shellfish, perhaps eight or nine different species, including flake stone, modified bone, and as well as some shell beads. And this is a trend that we see at other sites on the property and in the broader region as well. This type of artifact assemblage is usually associated with habitation type sites or a village of some sort. The tribe has asked to keep locations confidential, so I'm presenting a schematic version of the findings. This is a concept of a density map that is made using the results from the catch and release survey. What the map shows is symbology that changes by the density of artifacts in the soil sample. So the small red circles show an absence of artifacts, while the small green circles indicate a low artifact density, and the bigger green circles indicate a higher density. This information can be used to develop boundaries for the site so that the BLM can avoid the area when planning for trails and parking lots when the monument opens. These density maps are also a fundamental step for doing more advanced eco-archaeological testing which uses a density map like this to determine where to place geophysical grids, augers, and excavation units. Let's take a look at a different density map on a different part of the property, but at a landscape perspective. So the map I showed before was of a specific site and it consisted of about 30 catch and release units. The map that I have here shows several archaeological sites and about 300 catch and release units. These sites are all on top of alluvial terrace along the canyon floor and within this dense riparian woodland with bay, buckeye, alder, redwood, and plenty of banana slugs. All the sites here contain artifact assemblages that are consistent with habitation related activities, which also match the broader trends of the area. From a broad spatial perspective, we see a high density of archaeological surfaces along the canyon floor. This would have been where native people were living and moving up and down the canyon, but it is now a really dense forest that is really shady as well. And I should clarify that it was by no means easy to access these survey locations. It was a lot of machete swinging and using garden loppers to cut walls of shrubs and woody vines. It doesn't take much of an imagination to see that when native people were living in this canyon, it would have been a much more of an open environment, or at least the understories had low amounts of debris. Documenting the spatial distribution of surface artifacts helps us understand the basic dimensions of a cultural landscape, but it is still incomplete without overlaying the information from the vegetation and ethnobotanical surveys.
This brings us to our next concept, the biological component of the integrative survey. Here we are with a landscape scale comp composite map of the ethnobotany and the vegetation type survey results. This map allows us to look at the ratios of vegetation coverage and where certain ethnobotanical plants are located. The map is also telling us a story at a glance. The story is that the northern coastal scrub is a baby blue in baby blue shading is now covering a relatively extensive area compared to grasslands and even more so native grasslands in the yellow. This is important because Northern coastal scrub is one of the first vegetation types to succeed a grassland in the absence of a broad disturbance like fire. It would be interesting to compare this map to historical aerial photography as a way to measure changes in vegetation coverage in this cultural landscape over time. Many traditional sources of food and crafting material in this region are becoming harder and harder to find. There are fewer mature oak woodlands in these parts and native grasslands are even fewer. I was told by a current PhD student here at Berkeley, an Amamutsin tribe member, Alexi Sagona, that access to good quality sources of plants has been a longstanding barrier to the cultural revitalization efforts. These integrative surveys, along with the help of local experts, have been an important effort for prior prioritizing locations where harvesting and other cultural activities can occur, such as traditional stewardship. When it comes to crafting and basket weaving, native people will be quick to tell you that you need the best high quality materials, which are only available under a regime of stewardship and tending. For some perspective, scholars have suggested that a cooking basket may require up to 4,000 deer grass stalks, cradle boards for babies, about 600 straight sourberry stems, and a 12 meter wide net for catching fish would require up to 2,100 meters of cordage, roughly about 35,000 plant stalks. Now the point I'm trying to make here is that these integrative surveys are shedding much needed light on the condition of local ethnobotanical resources, which is of special use to tribes today. Let's take a quick look at one of these ethnobotanical patches up close before we move on. This is the marvelous California beaked hazel. Previous archaeobotanical research in the area has shown that hazelnuts may have been a preferred nut food for the native people living in this area. But harvesting hazels has been a challenge due to access and also unmanaged conditions of certain stands. These integrative surveys have made it possible to pinpoint some notable stands of hazel, often growing near archeological sites on the property. While we don't currently know if these relic patches relate to indigenous occupation of the area, it was one of the most numerous patches of hazelnuts that we encountered on the property. Areas like this may be good candidates to experiment with cultural burning and other stewardship te techniques to enhance this resource. And I hate to do this, but I got to pause really quick to plug in my charger. Be right back. One second. While he's doing that, I just want to mention that those of you listening, um, the live chat was off, but now it is on. So you may have to refresh your browser to see it, but hopefully you can all see the chat box. You can ask questions at the end. Thank you, Sarah. All right, I'm back. Battery's plugged in now. All right, let's move on and take a look at some of the preliminary eco-archeology span of a site that is situated in the Santa Cruz mountains. So we're now moving from the integrative surveys of the broader landscape and towards the investigation of a specific archaeological site. The map on the left shows in the red the perimeter of the CZU lightning complex fire that swept through the Santa Cruz Mountains last August. The participation in the perspectives of the Amamutsin were requested to help land managers in the mountains document an archaeological site discovered to have been damaged by activities related to the fire. This was a hot fire that burned almost 100,000 acres and unfortunately killed a couple people and destroyed more than a thousand structures. In collaboration with UC Berkeley and Alma Mutsin, surveys and limited testing was carried out to understand the general condition, the attributes and other basic information about the site. Here, we're, we were able to lay down a few dozen catch and release units while also carrying out ground penetrating radar, magnetometer grids, 
of areas with high surface densities. We also did a few augers, which all the soil was collected and is currently undergoing flotation analysis here in the labs at UC Berkeley. We began looking at the site using the catch and release. And from that, we were able to learn that the site boundary was much larger than we anticipated. Just like the coastal sites, the surface artifacts appear to be similar, such as chipstone debitage, faunal remains, and a diverse number of shellfish. And might I remind you that this site is about two and a half or three miles from the coast over rough terrain and is, at about, and is about 1,200 feet in elevation. It's not exactly waterfront property, but people that lived here still made choices to harvest and process coastal foods. I just think it's really neat and shows the importance of marine foods even at sites in the interior. We are interested to see what we can opportunistically learn about how native people were using natural resources and what foods were being processed in the mountain areas. Investing time and resources into doing eco-archaeology is important at sites like this because previous research has focused only on coastal lowland sites. So our current understanding of the complete cycle of resource use and land stewardship that occurred by tribes is incomplete. Activities at the site appear to have negatively impacted some of the areas. There are several push, push piles or artificially deposited soil on the surface of the site that contain archeological material. There's also evidence of logging and dragging logs through the site. The most significant of the impacts is a road cut, probably 20 to 30 centimeters deep, which exposed some intact archeological features. We are still deciding what would be the best strategy for researching or stewarding these areas. Now I'm gonna briefly talk about the radar and magnetometer survey. I'm not gonna go into too many details, but the goal of doing these scans was to detect areas that contain archeological features uh, rich with ecofacts. These features would be like an earth oven or another occupation surface, like a house floor. The geophysical is also a quick way for us to look at broad areas of the site subsurface without doing any impact. We are still post-processing this data and we are looking forward to taking a closer look in the future. We also judgmentally place seven auger units based on landform and surface artifact distributions. Our team agreed to screen each auger sample for human remains before collecting the sample for lab analysis. Augers are a great way uh, to, you know, they're pretty neat. They give you a lot of information really quick. They can tell you about the depth of deposits as well as gives you a, a glimpse at the stratigraphic regimes of the site. It also gives you a look at the artifact frequencies through a vertical sequence. While there are some limitations due to the spatial coverage of auger sampling, we are seeing a few interesting trends based on the limited number of samples processed so far. One thing we learned about the site is that it's about a meter, a meter deep and some areas have discrete complex stratigraphy. The lab analysis is also showing a lot of obsidian and shirt debitage also faunal remains, groundstone fragments, and also a few shell beads. Again, the artifact assemblage is fairly consistent with what we see at the coastal lowland sites, but the obsidian frequencies are beginning to tell us a story. Obsidian is relatively uncommon in the Santa Cruz Mountains, so we're interested to see if we can apply X-ray fluorescence and do a sourcing study once the lab processing, processing is complete. With the time I have left, I would like to turn to the Native Plant Propagation Project. The Yamamutsun Land Trust operates a greenhouse in field beds where seeds of grassland species are collected and propagated by tribe members to be directly used in ecological restoration of culturally sensitive areas and cultural landscapes. What is neat about the integrative surveys that I talked about earlier is that it's helped this effort along from the GIS information about the locations of certain plants. This is crucial because an agreement for the propagation project was that seed sources need to be collected specifically from the Santa Cruz mountains. It's one thing to call up a nursery that's in another county and ask for 10 pounds of seed, but it's another thing to collect 10 pounds of seed in the wild, locally.
with all the species out there, how does the Amamutsin decide which plants to prioritize? Well, the tribe has interestingly turned to archaeology and archaeobotany for guidance regarding which plants were the most commonly used by native people in the area. The tribe also turns to oral histories about preferred foods and ethnographic documents that detail what foods were important to the diet. Some of these foods are red maids, tarweed, several grass seed species, and also brodeas, known as Indian potatoes. What is also interesting is that this project has benefited from the assistance of many volunteers, comprised of retired and working locals, academics, students, and just native plant enthusiasts who have collectively contributed hundreds of hours of hands-on time with this project. Rob Cuthrell, who completed his PhD at Cal and now manages this plant propagation project, said that the volunteers meet a few times a month and they have created a community of sort where people share ideas about plant propagation and share gifts such as fresh fruit as well as coffee and donuts and have a space to interact with tribe members. I just think it's really cool and neat that the Amamutsin's native plant propagation project has evolved and created this community space on the Santa Cruz coast. I want to finish off by talking about the difficulties of finding certain species on the Santa Cruz coast. For example, red maids are known ethnographically as a California Indian favorite food and is recovered archaeologically as well. What even makes this plant more challenging to locate is that its flowering time is relatively quick and only opens up in the afternoon. The plant is also just a few inches tall, so it's really, really hard to see amongst an ocean of exotic grassland. But one positive note was that our teams were able to locate just a few individuals. And from those few individuals, we were able to propagate hundreds of red made plants that will hopefully go on to produce seed to, to produce seed amounts necessary for restoration. This is all pretty neat stuff, if you ask me. There are a lot of people involved in these projects, too many to name. Uh, funding for this project has come from a variety of sources, but I want to personally thank the Stahl Fund from the ARF and the Rosier Student Award from the Society of California Archaeology for helping the archaeology get off the ground. A big thanks to the Amamutsin Tribal Band for none of this work would be possible if it wasn't for their dedication of the Native Stewardship Corps, as well as all the talented staff at the Amamutsin Land Trust. A special thanks to Gabe Sanchez and Brett Jackson for flying all the way out from Michigan as well as Mike Groen for driving up from San Diego to help out with this work. And finally, I want to thank Kent Lightfoot, Christine Hastor, and Junko Habu for their mentorship over the past few years. And also to Rob Cuthrell for involving me in the several aspects of stewardship work on the Santa Cruz coast, providing overall guidance over the years. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Now, thank you very much for listening. Hey, thanks, Alec. That, that was great. So, Sarah, I know you're going to uh, handle the questions, but let me just start with one here. So, so Alec, you did a really nice job in terms of uh, talking about the integration of the archaeology and the stewardship and also the uh, whole plant propagation program. So, so when do you, you know, I know you and Rob have worked really uh, with the tribe specifically on that plant propagation program. So when do you think you're gonna actually start using, uh, bringing back some of these plants, you know, in terms of restoring the ecology of the areas that uh, are being looked at, like at Kiroste Valley? Is there a timeline for that? And will there be some cultural burning that will be done first and then they'll bring the plants in? What, what, what do you think is gonna happen? Yeah, Ken, that's a great question. I, and I'll, I'll speak very generally about it. You know, the Quito State Valley, the, the Native Stewardship Corps have been doing a lot of work down there, uh, removing Douglas firs and removing exotic weeds. So it's been primed or prepared for to do uh, ecological restoration. And I think the deadline uh, to put some plants in the ground will be next spring. So really looking forward to seeing how that's going to play out. Um, but, you know, I think the, the main takeaway here is that, it, you know, these things take a little bit of time. They take a little mm -hmm. bit of planning to, to, you know, have all the pieces in motion because, you know, ec ecological restoration can, comes with certain challenges, many setbacks. 
So, but yeah, we're, we're keeping our hopes up for next spring to put plants in the ground in Quito State Valley. And will you be using the seeds at all too, Alec? You know, and the seeds and you got seedlings and seeds is, have you guys, have you thought about how those will be implemented with the tribe? Um, yeah, you know, for, for the, for right now, the goal is just to complete the, uh, the requirements for this project that are outlined in the grant. And then once we complete that, we'll put our heads together and see what other uh, variety of things that can happen. Um, but I think that, you know, this restoration project is a, is a neat model for going forward and shows a diversity of things that you can do with indigenous stewardship. Yeah, well, that's great. So, Sarah, do we have any uh, questions from the chat function? I don't see any in there um, just yet. And I want to remind the people who are viewing, if you can't see the chat box on the right side, ah, here's one. <laughs> so I guess they can see it. Um, yeah, please post your, your questions in the chat um, if you have any questions for Alec. So Tim Gill is asking, um, how do you keep the plantings from being overwhelmed by very robust invasive plants? He's assuming that it requires constant tending. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a really good question. And, and in terms of uh, a restoration plan, you know, one thing that the tribe is thinking about is establishing these, these patches of ethnobotanical plants. And so rather than spacing them out across the land, um, the tribe is thinking to establish these patches, which may give them a chance to establish themselves and then expand outward. So, yeah, that's kind of my, you know, my answer to that question would be um, to replant in patches mixture of native plants rather than expansive throughout um, broad areas. And we have another question from Nico, which is, is it typical to find shellfish at over the 1,000 feet of elevation? Yeah, you know, I, I think that's a pretty good question. And, you know, my personal experience, I, I haven't really done too much archaeology in the interior. Uh, but I think the general idea is that you do see shell going all the way inland. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's uh, totally uncommon, but we're, we're still trying to figure that out, actually. Great. Um, then we have another, another question from a viewer um, named Anton Molodetsky. Um, can you talk more about the artifacts lost in the fire? Uh, how does that impact the research and how will that impact research in the fires to come? Thanks, Anton. It's a great question. So the the fires themselves probably aren't destroying uh, artifacts. You know, one thing that we did see at the site is that the fire kind of moved around in a patchwork at the site. So there was areas that were completely unburned, but there were also areas that did get burned. Uh, one advantage to having a, a burned area is that it increases your visibility. And so you'll be able to see surface artifacts a little bit better. But in terms of direct impacts of fires, I think that depends on the site and what's at the site. So features maybe like bedrock mortars or rock art might be a little bit more susceptible to damage from fire. But the sites that we're dealing with, uh, they don't really contain those features. Um, so I think the question's still out there about its, its real impact to the surface. Good question. Um, that is the end of the online questions for now. Um, I'll chime in if someone has another question. Yeah, so I'll just, I have a one, one more follow-up, Alec. So, so you're working on this damage site with the tribe and you've done a little bit of augering and you've done some of the uh, surface, you know, survey work. Um, so what are the plans in the future? What do, what, what do you plan to do and working with the tribe and the stewardship core um, you know, uh, what are your next steps? Yeah, it's a good question, Kent. You know, I, I really think the current goal is to analyze everything that we have collected from the augers. So it's that it, it's pretty labor intensive. It requires a light fraction and heavy fraction analysis. So we're dealing with very small seeds and very small fragments of faunal remains. But once we wrap all that up, I think it would be important to meet with the tribe and present everything that we know and talk to them to see if this is something that they want to continue to pursue. Present all the data and we'll put our heads together to see if, um, you know, this is something that the tribe has interest in, doing more um, in-depth excavation, opening up more areas, doing more GPR. So yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to having that conversation, but right now 
my current goals to wrap up everything that we already have, which are about seven, seven augers that range about two liters per sample. So there'll probably be a little bit more time before I get through all those. Excellent. Yeah, no, that sounds, that sounds like a great strategy. So Sarah, any other questions at all? Yes, there's another one from Junko Habu, who's asking, um, if, can you tell us more about coastal sites versus non-coastal sites? Are you finding more inland sites than archeologists previously assumed? Yeah, Junko, you know, that's a, that's a great question. And you know, one thing that I always like to emphasize is that these systematic surveys that are done, these integrative systematic surveys that are done with tribal participation and using their perspectives, it just hasn't been carried out um, in the Santa Cruz Mountains on large scale. So, you know, I have a feeling that once we do apply this sort of approach to these sites, um, we're going to have a better idea of what constitutes inland sites versus coastal sites. But it's very exciting because, you know, uh, the majority of our work has focused on the lowland. And we're now looking to have this trajectory going, um, you know, into the interior higher elevations to really see what's going on, see if there's any differences in land use, settlement, residents, stewardship, and so on. I guess I would say just a, a final point there is there, you know, our general idea is that in the interior, there's more of an emphasis of nut use, nut resource use. So like, you know, acorns, uh, bay nuts, and then also, um, you know, wild game versus the coast. We see uh, great frequencies of marine resource use as well as uh, grasslands and other seed foods. And yeah, that exactly matches her next comment was to, that it would be interesting to see how important plant food was as opposed to marine food in the two areas. Thank you. Um, I think that's it for the online comments. Is it? I think so. Looks like it. Excellent. Well, that's great. Well, thanks, Alec. That was a great talk. Any final words, Alec, you want to <clears throat> make before I think we, uh, we, uh, in this program? Uh, yeah, I'll just say, if you're interested in learning more about what the Amamutsin Land Trust are up to, go to their website, amamutsinlandtrust.org. And uh, yeah, take a look at what they have going on. And if you're interested in contributing, um, that would be a great place to get some more information. Yeah, I should also mention, there's a number of jobs that are out being posted right now uh, for doing work with the Amamutsin Land Trust. So you may wanna check that out in terms of, uh, work in the, the greenhouse program, uh, doing actually some of the integrated survey work, uh, as well as um, some of the coastal stewardship work that the tribe is doing. Uh, these are actually very well-paying jobs uh, that the Alma Mutsun Land Trust and the tribe are, are now posting. So yeah, you definitely want to check out their, their website. Um, yeah, that, that's a great point, Alec. Good stuff. All right, well, with, with that, I think we will go ahead and uh, end this program. Thank Alec for a really uh, wonderful talk. And uh, we look forward to seeing everybody uh, next week, next Wednesday for our next ARF uh, brown bag lecture. Thanks again, Alec. Sarah and Nico, anything you need to say, uh, final words? No, I think that's it. Thank you so much for hosting and thank you, Alec, for speaking today. Yeah, great we'll see you all next week.